Hi, this is Jim Cunningham and welcome to Millennials and Their Families, Hot Estate Planning Topics. So this is something that is really important for a huge segment of society. Very important, this is information, you know, don't look at this and go do a bunch of stuff on your own. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, this is a great resource. We have a lot of videos, a lot. We take real deep dives into rather esoteric topics that may or may not be of interest to you. And if you do uh, find that of value, please share that with people who you think can benefit from it. Uh, I'm an attorney, Jim Cunningham. We have offices throughout Northern and Southern California. And these are our team members here at Cunningham Legal. We're all devoted entirely to trust and estate matters. So we're what you would call a boutique firm. And I've been, I am the managing partner soon to be the founding partner and Rochelle is taking over as managing partner. I have 25 years experience offices throughout California. We help clients, our firm helps clients in Missouri, Texas, Virginia, Washington state and Washington DC. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law. Um, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot. So let's talk about millennials and their families. This is really something that lawyers, I will tell you, in my industry, we're starting to talk about this, and we'll see why. But millennials, I think more, maybe more than any generation, need some of the most sophisticated estate planning. And, and this may be counterintuitive, but as you go through this, you'll, you'll understand what, what I'm talking about. The, millennials are the generation that is least likely to be married, uh, they too often lack legal protections for inheritances, tax benefits, social security and disability benefits. We'll cover those a little bit today. Millennials are having children and they need to plan for their future. So it complicates things um, a, a little bit if, you know, if married versus unmarried and having children, those are unique uh, sort of special issues. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then also uh, we can't ignore the millennials parents um, and caring for aging parents. This is where the parent becomes the child and the child becomes the parent. And if you and your parents live long enough, there's a high probability of that happening. And estate planning for parents as well as protection of inheritances. So uh, here is kind of the agenda for today. We're going to talk about naming a guardian and why that's important. And we'll talk about estate planning, but really that's kind of the lead here, which is uh, because I went through this when, when my wife and I had our children is who is going to be that person to care for our children if, you know, we get hit by the proverbial cement truck uh, and, and die, right? I will also talk about saving. Now, this may be counterintuitive. You think, well, Jim, that's not really estate planning, but I do want to talk about saving and the importance of saving. Real estate finance, we're going to cover a concept called leverage, and I think it's very important to understand that. Too many people don't understand that. We'll cover retirement accounts and then also making sure you have income security while you're working. What I mean by that is if you stop working, right, and what do your loved ones do? If you're a, a person who's earning money, what do those people do if you can no longer work? And then we'll finish it up with um, estate planning for millennials' parents, and this is a tie-in with the millennials estate plan as well. We'll talk about what it means to be a successor trustee and estate planning for parents and as, as well as protecting inheritances from threats. So who or what is a millennial? What the heck am I talking about? Well, a millennial is defined as a person born between 1981 and 1995. I'm a Gen Xer. So I'm a different generation than the millennial generation. My children are Gen Z. My parents come before baby boomers, and those are the, what we call the silent generation, but we're not really going to uh, talk about them uh, too much today. And we'll start with our first poll. So we're doing this, mixing it up a little bit uh, today. So I'm going to launch our first poll, and you can go ahead and you can choose which are you. Are you born before 1946? Are you born between 46 and 64 or 65 and 80 or 81 and 95? or 1996 to 2010. So go ahead and uh, I'll give you all the opportunity uh, to answer this question. And so we've got a lot of people answering. Thank you for answering. We've got some people born before 46. And we'll give it a couple more seconds. Get your votes in. Uh, the there a lot has been written on baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials, and Gen Z, and the differences between them. Something to note is millennials are the largest part of the workforce today. So we have got most of our people, uh, and we will end the poll. And it looks like 
uh, a lot of baby boomers, a lot of Gen X and a lot of millennials. So good. So a nice smattering of people. So this is something that um, if when we're done here, this will be posted on, on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go ahead and put and share this with someone who you think might benefit. So let's talk, let's talk from the get go guardianship. What am I talking about here? So I, I think this is the single biggest reason people delay uh, people with minor children delay doing estate planning because they simply just can't figure it out. Like if something happens to me, what happens to my kids? Who's going to take care of my kids? There, uh, I would say the age of the child matters. If the child's one or 17, the court's going to treat them differently. And the cutoff age is about 14. That's when an individual can become what is called an emancipated minor in California. And so what that means is a 14-year-old has tremendous say on, on where they end up um, you know, who they live with if their parents pass away, you know, if the kid's five, it's going to be the courts and, and the family members. So uh, this is very important to understand, though, you nominate a guardian. So you appoint a successor trustee, you appoint an agent under a durable power of attorney, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is very important to understand is you nominate a guardian. Now, why what's going on? If a, a parent passes away, and there is no parent, right? So if you're if you're married and you have children and one spouse passes away, there's no need for a guardianship in many cases because there's a parent. If two people are not married and, and one unmarried parent passes away, well, then there's another parent. And so typically, uh, in many instances, there's no need for a guardianship. It's only when there's no parent, okay? And um, that's a nomination process. So what do I mean by that? Well, you nominate and you ask a probate judge, and this is where these are hurting in California, in the probate court, you ask the probate judge, hey, I would like to appoint my you know, brother, Bob, as successor trustee. And Bob goes through a vetting process. And there's something called the CLETS system, C-L-E-T-S, which is the California Law Enforcement Tracking System. So they want to figure out if this person who's been nominated as guardian is a creep or not. I mean, that's basically what's going on. Let's assume you, you pass all that muster. There are two types of guardianships. There are two flavors. There's a guardianship of the person and a guardianship of the estate. The guardian of the person signs the permission slips at, you know, at school. Remember where you would say signature of parent or guardian, right? And when I was a kid, I thought, what's a guardian? I mean, I don't know. But parent or guardian, that would be the guardian of the person would sign that. The guardian of the estate handles the money. And in California, those are split between two roles. Many times it's the same person, but sometimes it's not. And then there's a temporary and a permanent uh, guardianship. So sometimes if, if there's an emergency situation, somebody will be appointed temporary guardian pending a full hearing. And so there are two, um, two elements there potentially. Let's talk about probate. Probate is always a hassle. So if you're a millennial or you got millennial kids or whatever it is, uh, sometimes it's a nightmare. Probate's expensive, a million dollar estate in California. Now, if you have a million dollar home with a $950,000 mortgage, you have a million dollar estate. The probate fees are $50,000. So it's taken up, you know, in that sense, the probate fees are 100% of the estate. Um, and COVID has caused delays. Um, we are experiencing in, in many counties a tremendous delay of cases because of the COVID closures. And we're not certain that's going to work itself out for several years. I mean, that's kind of the, what lawyers and judges are talking about behind the scenes is this COVID recovery from COVID is going to take years. Um, it, it's important to understand that if you have a will, that will is uh, instructions to the probate court, wherein the probate court can choose to follow those or not for a variety of reasons. If you have no will, that is called intestacy. So uh, last will and testament intestate means you do not have a last will or testament and then your property goes um you know wherever the law says it goes and there are some really um unwarranted surprises in there probate is public p for probate probate is public living trusts are private okay so probate is a public uh process all of your assets are disclosed in in court filings that anyone can see all of your debts all of your family relations so if you have someone who's inheriting uh, maybe you have a kid or you've got a, um, another relative and there's a court order that says Johnny gets $10 million or Johnny gets a million dollars. So a lot of people kind of troll the, the public records to go take advantage of those people who inherit. Estate planning um, for millennials, let's talk about the living trust. So let's talk about uh, what is a living trust. A living trust is a bucket, okay? And there's kind of a, a, 
a tip in here. If you own a home, please pay attention to this. So that's really the, the demarcation. If you own a home in California, you're, you probably should be looking at a living trust. You still might want to be looking at a living trust if you don't own a home. But a living trust is where you take title from your own name and you put it in the name of this trust and you are trustee. So it's no different than taking uh, you know, the deed from your hands and putting it into a bucket and it's got a handle. Now you're not holding on to the home anymore. You're not holding on to the deed. It's in the trust, but you're holding the bucket handle and you're the trustee. So you're in charge of that. So nothing really changes. And this is, you know, this is the, the basic plan for millions of Californians that have done estate planning is, uh, is the living trust. And um, trust can be designed to protect against your heirs. So your children, typically your children's lawsuits, creditors, predators, and divorce. Divorce is a real threat. I think the most significant threat to an inheritance, a child inherits property, and then the child's spouse uh, seeks to divorce that spouse, even though that property is characterized as separate property when the one child inherits it, a lot can happen after that, right? If you start, if you put it into a joint account, is it community property or not? A judge is going to decide. What if you tell your spouse, oh yeah, it's community property and I'll pay our community property expenses. Is it community property then? We don't know. These are things where you go through a court and a judge uh, ultimately determines what is community and what is separate. But the point is it's at risk without planning. Uh, we uh, recommend personalized estate, personalized estate plans. So there's no like fill in the blanks like there are for a lot of forms. I would say a, a living trust is a very highly customized document, unlike a power of attorney or unlike an advanced healthcare directive. And we'll talk about those. Uh, paralegals aren't enough. Paralegals in our firm are part of the process, but they work under the supervision and direction of lawyers. So we work together. Um, and there is a process for a customized estate plan that we'll cover in the next slide. Again, if you own a home, think about a living trust. So law if you go to a lawyer, um, I, I will say that most of my colleagues do not follow robust processes. Uh, we do because we really focus on quality control. And unfortunately, you know, that's not always the case with, with law firms. So one of the things we really hit very hard is education. If you look at our YouTube page, we have now over hundred videos on our YouTube page, and it's a great resource to take a deep dive into the things that frankly may be interesting to you. Uh, we have a diagnostic process. So that's a lot. Um, and this is something, you know, whether you go with our firm or a different firm, find out, is this firm educating people? You know, you don't know a, a um, subject well enough until you can teach it. You know, you've heard that saying before. A diagnostic, what is a diagnostic? It is a uh, bird's eye view of all your assets and your family relations. It's very important for the lawyer before the lawyer meets with you, have that information, get that to the lawyer so the lawyer can take a look at it and be prepared for the meeting. And then that's where you have your first attorney meeting. That first meeting probably should be with an attorney. Um, I know some firms have that initial meeting with a paralegal. In our firm, we, you know, we just find out very early on, are we able to help this client or not? And then all that data that we gather from the, from the, uh, from the client is reviewed by senior paralegal. Again, this is quality control. And then we use a very robust software system, which, you know, if, if lawyers uh, aren't using this, I think it's a big mistake. It's just too complex now. It's kind of like AutoCAD. And then we create drafts and get those to the clients, um, for, you know, you, the client, and, um, and then you come in and sign your estate planning documents. And then we recommend that you take a look at those every year on your own. And certainly if there's a death, birth, divorce, whatever it is, uh, that would prompt you to, to seek out uh, the law firm for a review of your estate plan. I want to talk, cover a little bit about IRAs and 401ks, 403Bs, 457. So these are employer-sponsored retirement plans. I would say that if you have a large IRA and you have minor children, you're going to need some extra planning. Now, what do I mean by a large IRA? Well, that's very, um, you know, is $100,000 a large IRA? Is a million dollars a large IRA? I think it depends on the, on the individual situation. But once you get over 100000 or 150000 it's very important to understand that if you don't do this correctly, when you die and your kids inherit this IRA, many times all of the money comes out at once. So if you have a $100,000 IRA, that's $100,000 in taxable income. If you have a million dollar IRA or 401k, that's a million dollars taxable income. And unfortunately, we see in many situations when that person passes away, that there are a lot of income taxes paid. Uh, when, you know, when that person passes away, that could have been avoided with better planning. And so what I mean by that is with proper planning, 
those taxes are not paid all at once, but they're stretched out over the child's minority, right, until age 18, uh, after which time, uh, you know, they're, they can come in and yank all the money out, right? So you definitely want to plan for that because 18-year-olds typically are, <laughs> are not as responsible with money as 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds, right, as a general rule. Birthdays matter a lot because um, the, the date of birth uh, matters in IRAs and it determines how much money has to come out. So what I'm talking about is you put money into this IRA account, right? You put in a thousand dollars a month or 500 a month while you're working, you might have an employer match, right? When you reach a certain age right now, it's 72. That's a long time from now. If you're a millennial, when you reach 72, you have to start taking out distributions. Okay. When you inherit an IRA, you also have to take out distributions. This is very important to understand. So your IRA, not until you're 72. If you inherit an IRA from your parents or you leave an IRA to your children, then you have to start taking out distributions. And when your birthday is matters a whole lot. Uh, I would really encourage you to take a look at Roth IRAs. If you are um, saving, uh, retirement saving, if your employer offers a Roth 401k, I would really encourage you to look at that. Whether it's appropriate for you, I think, you know, requires an A team. It requires the financial advisor, CPA, um, perhaps lawyer in that situation, but I would, would encourage you to look at that if that's available. And the 10th year rule, basically when your kids inherit your IRA uh, or if you inherit an IRA, you have to take all the money out within 10 years. Now there's an exception if the child's a minor uh, or chronically ill or disabled, if the beneficiary is the person who gets the money. But in most situations, that money has to come out in 10 years. And so if you inherit a million dollar IRA from your parents, well, 10 years from now, that's gonna be worth 2 million hopefully, right? So now you're going to have 2 million in income coming to you uh, in, in one lump. So that's what that 10th year rule is. Uh, I would say there are terrible outcomes with IRAs and there are optimal outcomes. We just um, have um, updated our second edition of our book, which we'll cover here. And uh, we talk about the different outcomes with, with IRAs. So speaking of the book, that's me. Our second edition is out. You can go to our website and uh, buy the set book, Savvy Estate Planning, What You Need to Know Before You Hire the Right Lawyer. It's a bunch of stories. It's not legal technical, but what I do is I give you stories. I give you examples. I give you parables almost, right? Of good outcomes versus bad outcomes. And with that story, you really, um, it, it's a lot easier to learn the concept than if it's black letter law that you know, you're know you having a hard time staying awake watching. So if you own, again, if you own a home, consider a living trust. If you don't own a home, a will, a will may be an appropriate um, plan for you, a will-based plan. It may not. It just depends uh, on your individual circumstances. I do want to mention a durable power of attorney. These can be used. Um, they're almost like Jedi powers, durable powers of attorney. They can be used for good and evil, uh, depending on who the person is, who is the actor, right? Who is the uh, agent under the durable power of attorney. But a durable power of attorney covers everything that is not in your living trust. So not your house, not your stocks, not your bonds, not your mutual funds covers everything not in your trust, your IRAs, 401ks, life insurance, annuities, getting a registered letter from the, uh, the postal service. It covers everything not in the trust. And uh, these are, can be subject to a tremendous amount of abuse and, uh, or not, right? It just depends on who this, this actor is. So I would say choose wisely. The, dur the agent acting under the durable power of attorney can bind the principal. Right? So a trustee follows the terms of the trust and can't really bind the person who created the trust. What I mean is, is create like an enforceable uh, legal consequence. If you sign a durable power of attorney, depending on what that durable power of attorney says, that person can actually get a credit card right, against your, your credit. That person can buy and sell things, right? can, can bind you under, under many contracts. So very important. I would say a durable power of attorney is much broader than a living trust. Advanced Healthcare Directive says who makes healthcare decisions for you when you can't make them for yourself. It also says whether you want the plug pulled or not, which is something you need to think about and instruct people who are going to make these decisions for you. And a HIPAA authorization has to do with medical privacy and designating people to have access to your health information, not necessarily making decisions, but they have access to your health information. So here's our second edition. It's on our website. I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, we've updated it with a bunch of new IRA rules. Now let's turn to, we have a few questions here and let me see if I can get to these questions. 
Um, interested to get infos in revision of trust. Uh, Teresita, I, so when you do a living trust, you can create a living trust. You can also amend a living trust. And many instances, we are doing what is called a restatement of trust. So you have your trust. And when you do a really big amendment that replaces all of the terms of the trust, that is called a restatement. Uh, how much money should you have before having a living trust? That's a great question. So uh, a living trust, if you own real estate in California, or you have more than about 150,000 in assets, that's when you start looking at a living trust. If you have less than that, um, then, then you might be able to uh, get by with a will-based plan. Uh, Andrew at, hi, Andrew, how you doing? Can intellectual property ownership and the royalties be put into a trust? Yes, Andrew, um, I know you're in the, in the music industry. We've had many clients who, in the film and television and music industry space dealing with royalties. That is something you absolutely need to pay attention to. And it is very helpful if you identify your royalties. And what many artists do is they will create um, an LLC to have those royalties paid to that LLC because then you're not having to change the uh, registration or the ownership on your, on your various uh, bits of intellectual property. Anonymous asks, can my adult children have their own living trust? And if so, can my living trust give assets to their living trust, uh, where, which will protect them from divorce or creditors, where the living trust has specific language to keep it from my children's spouses if divorced? Anonymous, you're almost there. Uh, what we do in that situation is you create a living trust that goes to your children, but these are separate trusts from your child's living trust. So these are separate uh, irrevocable trusts because a living trust is a revocable trust, which has no creditor protection at all. An irrevocable trust is where you get the creditor protection. So I'd say you're almost there, except we wouldn't have those assets paid to the living trust. They would stay in a separate trust. And I will tell you, it's very common. I, I see patterns in wealthy families. Many wealthy families, uh, have plans that are necessarily complex. What I mean by that is, yes, they may have multiple trusts, but there's a really good reason to do that. And that's how you create and foster and, and grow multi-generational wealth. So sometimes you end up with multiple trusts. That's okay. Is the name of a living trust always to be the last name of the husband, last name of the wife, revocable trust? Is there a standard naming convention for the revocable living trust? Yeah. The standard naming convention is the Cunningham Trust, but uh, you could put whatever you want on there right? You could put the ABC trust. Most people put their name on the trust so that um, uh, I guess it's just kind of always the way we've done it, but it's also to quickly identify whose that is. But in many instance, we, instances, we do not use anyone's name on a trust, and sometimes that helps with privacy. Are inherited IRAs protected from divorces and creditors since they are put into specific names? No, not at all. And this is a really big problem. An inherited IRA the U.S. Supreme Court in 2014 ruled there is absolutely zero, none, nada, zilch, zippo, rien, whatever you want to say. There is zero creditor protection when it comes to uh, an inherited IRA. It's fair game in a divorce court. If my guardian has signed a document agreeing to be the guardian, is the process streamlined by the probate court? Kelly, no, it's not. They have to go through the same process, right? That's where the court appoints this person as, as guardian. What is, uh, what is the value when you say wealthy? Wow, that's, you know, wealthy. I don't know, different things to different people. Uh, the term, uh, you know, there are millionaires. If you have a million dollars, right? It used to be kind of a big deal, like the Monopoly guy. Uh, now, not so much. Um, 10 million, is that wealthy? I don't know, I think it depends. It's case specific. So talking about building wealth, let's talk about the importance of saving. And if you are younger and you are not saving, you're hearing it from this guy, I did not value saving enough when I was younger, okay? So here's, here's the benefit of savings. It helps you navigate all the stuff that comes up in life. You may have a finance, you know, if you need new tires, that's $2,000 or 1,500, you need savings to pay for those tires, right? You can't just put it on a credit card, okay? People build wealth by saving. Spend less than you make. If you have heard that from older people, the reason they're telling you that is they're number one, they're right, and they have a lot of experience, and that is the right thing to do. It is very tempting to go keep spending, 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 but um, saving is a even if it's a small amount. I think this is part of 
creating financial security and freedom. And, you know, there are financial emergencies that pop up, whether it's tires or uh, you might need a roof or something comes up, you might have a health issue come up, you're going to need that extra money. And debt can be very stressful to people. It can drive people nuts. And savings <laughs> helps avoid debt. You see where I'm going with this? Savings helps avoid debt and and reduces your stress. Okay. So very, very important. I think people don't really think enough about saving when they're younger. Um, on savings, what's recommended six months or a year? I think that's uh, Teresita. I think that question is, you know, I've heard people say you should have six months um, in savings of your, of your, um, of your monthly earnings, right? Six months. Uh, I'm not, you know, I think it's case specific. I think it, it, it's kind of whatever makes you feel better. Right. If you have a pad of two or three months, if you if you feel uh, uh, just viscerally in your gut better, then I think that's that's good. But anything is is better than nothing. So here's some tips: um, paying off debt. If you're in debt and you're wondering how do I get out of debt, you can look at your highest interest rate and you can look at your lowest balance. Because if you have five credit cards. And it might make you feel really good to pay off one of those and you feel like you're making progress rather than paying off maybe a higher interest, higher balance. You kind of feel like you're not making headway, but paying off debt is a really good way to do that. If it means getting a second job, get a second job. I mean, it just got it out, right? Make it happen, but pay that debt off. Um, there are a lot of automatic memberships out there that are auto renewal and subscriptions, you know, and you think, well, it's only a dollar. It's only $5. Uh, pay attention to that. Buying generic stuff instead of name brand, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, cable, if you're a millennial, you probably don't even have cable, but uh, that's a, you know, a $300 a month bill. Um, and also saving money automatically. You know, if you're in a, an employer-sponsored 401k and they match, let me explain what this is. If you work at a company and they say, we have a 401k and we match, and you're like, match what? I don't know what you're talking about. If you make 50000 a year and you can put away 4%, that's $2,000 you'd be putting away. Many companies will match an additional $2,000. And too many people say, I can't afford $2,000 less a year in income, which I, when I hear that, I think you got to find a way to do that because your, your employer is going to give you another $2,000. Like, why wouldn't you do that? It doesn't make sense not to do that. Well, they say, well, where am I going to get the $2,000? I don't know. Get a job at Starbucks three days a week or something. I, whatever it is, whatever it takes to get that extra money because you're really leaving a lot of money uh, on the table and you'll see over time how much that really adds up to be. And saving money automatically, that is, that is part of saving money automatically through, um, through an automatic 401k contribution. You can also put money into a savings account. Um, and I think I've seen even some banks, they round it up. And so if you buy something for $1.75, that extra 20, they round up to two and that 25 cents goes to a savings account. You see where I'm going with this, even a small amount, um, reducing energy. So this is, there was a comedian who said, uh, on one of his bits, he says, you know, my dad always turned the thermostat down in the winter. And I was always complaining as a kid. And then when I had to, when I got older and I had to pay the bill, he kept turning the thermostat down. Right. So, um, and, and depending on where you are in California, sometimes the summer you have a very high electrical bill, uh, but you know, turn the thermostat up. Unsubscribing from emails is a bit of a hack in the sense of uh, a shortcut. You're not gonna get prompted by, oh, buy this, buy that. Uh, look at your insurance, pack your lunch, eat at home. I've been reading a lot about returning to work post COVID. The cost of food, and we've all seen this, the cost of food at restaurants has gone absolutely through the roof. So it probably more than ever, um, eating at home and bringing your lunch to work, uh, if you are returning to work, does make sense. Paying, uh, paying cash and asking for discounts. When I was younger, I used to ask for discounts and it really embarrassed my wife. But you know what? Sometimes you get them, they go, oh, well, are you a this or a that? We can give you an extra 20% off. So these are just some basics. Again, the take advantage of the IRA 401k. You know, if you go and buy uh, a... Uh, go to a coffee shop every day and buy a coffee, you could be spending five, six, seven bucks, 10 bucks a day, depending on what you're buying. That adds up over time. That's three, 4,000 a year, right? Um, visit the library. What a concept. You know what the library is full of? Books, DVDs, movies, the whole litany, everything. They've got a ton of stuff there. Go to your library. That Guess what? They're empty. Uh, staycation. If you live in a nice place, do something local. Don't spend the money, especially right now. Looking at if you've looked at hotels lately, 
it is insane what hotels are going. It's, you know, two, three, four times what they normally go for. Um, another one is, is sell any, everything that doesn't bring you joy and don't buy anything that doesn't bring you joy. Okay. Just get rid of the stuff. So not quite minimalist, but you see where I'm going with this. There are some things that you can do some hacks. Um, I do want to talk to you about leverage on real estate. And this comes, uh, my son is 26 and he works for a national um, real estate, uh, commercial real estate firm. And something I've learned by hanging out with him and his friends is not everybody knows this stuff. So if, if you're looking at this going, Jim, why are you talking about this? Because this is so obvious. Guess what? A lot of people don't know about what I'm about to talk about. Okay. I'm going to talk about leverage and leverage is using borrowed money to buy a property. Okay. So I just came off of saying, don't run up debts, but I'm talking about a credit card. I'm not talking about something that is an investment using other people's money, OPM, okay, using other people's money to acquire assets that increase in value and provide income. That's the type of debt I'm talking about. So this would be the good debt. So what you do is you borrow money from a bank to buy an investment property and you, um, you increase your returns by using other people's money. And this is one reason why real estate investing is so attractive. It, it helps create wealth and especially fights inflation because rents, remember rents track with inflation. All right. And we're going through an inflationary cycle. I lived through it in the early eighties. This will end. Interest rates will go up, but wages are also going up. So we're going through this inflationary cycle where things are going to be more expensive forever. Okay. That's just the way it's going to be. So what can we do in terms of uh, how does leverage work? So leverage works like this. And I'm using, I know I'm using an example. And if you look at this, you say, Jim, what property is a hundred thousand dollar property in California or anywhere? I could have used a million. I'm just using this to explain a concept of leverage just so that it makes the math easier. Let's assume that you have a hundred thousand dollars to invest versus 20,000 to invest. Okay. So you're going to allocate a hundred or, or, or 20,000. These are your two choices on. If you have a hundred, let's say you just have a hundred thousand sitting around, you can buy a property. And property in California has increased on average 6.2% over the last 40 years. So in 12 years, if you use that linear, which never happens, but if you use this linear projection, the property will be worth 200 years, uh, $200,000 in 12 years. So if you bought a property for 100,000 and paid cash for it, and it goes up to 200,000, you've gotten a 100% return on your money using your own money, not using OPM, which is other people's money. If instead you have 20,000, or let's say you only have 20,000 and you're like, how can I buy a hundred thousand dollar house with only 20,000? You purchase one property for a hundred thousand dollars. You put $20,000 down and you take back a mortgage of $80,000 in California. It is a note secured by a deed of trust. And you put $20,000 in the property. Guess what? That same property still goes to $200,000. Well, now on the first instance, you had a hundred percent return on your money here you have a 500% return on your initial investment of $20,000. Now, granted, I'm not counting the rents and the debt service, but I'm just giving you this concept of leverage and what leverage means, okay? And so right now, you know, they're saying that inflation's, as we do this in, in March of 2022, inflation's running at over 7%, yet mortgage rates are 4%. This is crazy, right? So you can borrow money at 4% and next year, you're, you're really going to be 3% ahead of the game. You see where I'm going with this? So using leverage, using debt in a responsible way does make sense. This is not credit card debt, all right? Credit card debt's bad debt. Uh, but using other people's money to invest in real estate does make sense. And so we have a couple of questions here. Uh, Anonymous asks, in California... Is there any way of keeping inherited assets out of your marital assets and divorce, like keeping the funds in your name only and not commingling? I don't want my children to deal with an irrevocable trust with all the administrative headaches. Anything you, anything you can do without creating an irrevocable trust. Anonymous, the irrevocable trust is the superior mechanism. You would have to use a, an entity otherwise, um, which is probably more hassle than an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable trusts are very, in terms of the spectrum of hassle, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being a big hassle and one being uh, not a big hassle, they're like a two, okay? They're very low, low to deal with. How true is it that if your renters don't pay and have a hard time evicting them, you, you even have to give them money to leave? Yeah, my son is experiencing this on his renter. 
yeah, Teresita, I think, you know, we, we get these anecdotes that, you know, the tenants not paying rent, maybe they declare bankruptcy. Yeah, there's risk associated with investment properties. And that's one reason why, you know, risk reward. That's why there's a reward, right? Um, let's talk about retirement accounts. I, I really want to stress this. If this is the only thing, if you're a millennial or have a millennial loved one, please pay attention to this because I didn't do this enough when I was a kid. All right. I could have cobbled together even in the 80s, $2,000 a year. It's not that much money. Okay. Could have gotten a second job. This is, this is not particularly difficult to do. If you invest $2,000 a year from age 18 to 25, that's $16,000. Now I'm assuming a 10% rate of return, which may be high, maybe low, but here's just follow, follow me on this, right? At a 10% rate of return, that $16,000 is going to be a 1.1 million when you're 65. That's insane. That's nuts. And Albert Einstein, what did he say? Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it, right? Um, folks do this, right? Save. This is one of the advantages of saving. This is one of the advantages of retirement accounts because it's $2,000 a year. Um, you know, you're not paying tax on those returns because it's in this tax-free zone, this tax-deferred zone. Raw, a Roth IRA is a better vehicle because those distributions, when they come back out to you, they're not taxable. Again, don't forget 401k matching, right? Um, you're, you're, and many employers will match uh, your contribution to a 401k or, or part of it. So let's talk about um, income security. Now, what do I mean by income security? For those of you who are working and you have dependents, uh, here's here's what what people do, and this is what I did when I was younger. I got term life insurance. So what is term life insurance? Well, I bought, for example, a twenty year contract. Meaning, if you pay a thousand, I'm just making this up. You pay a thousand dollars a year, and for that thousand dollars a year for twenty years, you get one million dollars in coverage. So if I died, that million dollars would pay out to my wife, and that would replace my income. You see where I'm going with this? So this is designed. There are two basic types of life insurance. The life insurance that's term that is designed to pay out for a specific need, a specific purpose, like replacing income, paying off debt, whatever it is. And it's a fundamentally designed to replace income. Then there's permanent insurance. Now, permanent insurance is designed to pay out, not just in case you die within the next 20 years, but it's designed to pay out when you die, period, right? It's designed to stick around for the rest of your life. It builds what is called cash value. It's often used to fund retirement on a tax-free basis, meaning if you make uh, premium payments on a life policy and build cash value, you can borrow against that cash value and live on it and not pay tax. Okay, so that's really important to understand. And um, you know, it's designed to pay out even now up to age 105. That's the new mortality table went way out to 105, which um, that's really old, right? 105, it used to be 100. Right, and they've they've pushed it out to 105, which means that insurance has gotten a little bit cheaper. The cost of overall cost of insurance has gotten cheap, uh, gotten cheaper. And um, there's some variants on this. Sometimes we use an irrevocable life insurance trust for a specific tax death tax planning need, and also disability insurance. You know, it's something to consider. Uh, I had disability insurance uh, for a while, and then uh, for whatever reason, I I stopped it. But disability insurance says that if you're disabled a benefit kicks in so that if you can't work, you know, for example, uh, you might have a job that requires uh, physical activity. So if you're, I don't know, a surgeon and you can't do surgery anymore, that's, gonna, that's a real problem, right? Um, and so you can ensure that risk so that if, you're, if you can no longer work, you get a monthly benefit. Um, why, anonymous asks, why is only perm life, permanent life insurance in a trust and not term life insurance? So life insurance typically does not go in your living trust. It, you hold it in your name. The life insurance, when it's used to pay death taxes, we put into an irrevocable life insurance trust. So it is excluded from the estate of the person that um, is insured. So if I'm buying a policy, if I buy a $10 million second to die policy that ensures my life and my wife's life, when the survivor of us dies, 10 million is paid out, but it's not included in my estate. So it's a workaround on inclusion of the death benefit 
in um, uh, the death benefit on a life insurance policy. When you take a loan from the cash value with permanent life insurance, do you pay taxes on the amount taken? No, you don't. You pay interest, but not taxes. And so this is why it's really important to work with your A team, which is the attorney, the CPA, the financial advisor, because what we find is there are many layers and it's almost like stages in retirement. So somebody might say, look, I am retiring at age 60 and I want to, I really want to go travel the world for 10 years. Okay. That's a specific need. There are tax issues involved in that because when you hit 72, you've got RMDs required minimum distributions from retirement. So it might make sense to build up cash value. You know, it might make sense to use some of the retirement funds when in your sixties and then in your seventies, when your um, when your income taxes go up because of your required minimum distributions, you might tap into the cash value. So a lot of variables on there, and you can see why it's it's really a math puzzle, and why it's good to have uh, the right A team. So uh, let's talk about being successor trustee. So Anita asks: So are annuities excluded from taxes at the time of payout? No, annuities are double taxed. Anita, not only are they included in your estate. But on many annuities, you got to pay income tax on the gain. So if you put 100000 in and it's worth 300000 200000 of that is going to be taxable as income at death. There is an alternative to that. Uh, yeah, darn. Sorry, Anita. Uh, all right. So being successor trustee, if you're a millennial and you have parents and you're responsible they very well might name you as successor trustee. What the heck is a successor trustee? So a successor trustee is when the trustee, let's say your parents are the trustees, when they pass away or they stop being trustee, maybe they resign, maybe they become incapacitated and you take over as trustee, what do you do? Do you have to do anything? Like what are the rules, right? Everyone must take action, okay? People have to do stuff. So this is typically within the context of somebody dying. The trustee must take action. And on a very high level, the trustee has to inventory the assets and take control of the assets, must pay the debts and the taxes, and then make distributions. I mean, that's, you know, that's just kind of a basic fundamental process that goes on. There are a lot of things that a trustee has to do beyond following the terms of the trust, and we have a whole webinar on this, on being a successor trustee, is there's a lot of stuff that you have to do that you may not know you have to do. And I would say, you know, one of the things that are, that's kind of cringeworthy in our law firm is when other professionals who aren't lawyers, sometimes a CPA, sometimes a financial advisor, uh, they don't have the knowledge that a lawyer has. And they say, well, this is very simple. You know, you've got a trust, and you've got two beneficiaries, and you've got $200,000, just write a $100,000 check to each of the beneficiaries, because all we're doing is following the terms of the trust. But the trustee's missing out on a whole bunch of other stuff they have to do, okay? So something to understand is you have personal liability as a trustee, 100% personal liability. We also have kind of changed this sort of changing world now. We have a lot of clients with crypto assets, with digital assets. You know, what happens to your Facebook account when you die? Who owns that? Um, what about crypto? You know, there's a lot of different ways to hold crypto. Uh, what about passwords in general? That's just kind of a weird thing. Like, what, what do you do? A lot of people, they write out the, print out their passwords and put them in a safe. Um, you know, these are some, some real world issues. Credit cards are an interesting one. Um, you know, if, if you are married and are, have a credit card with your spouse on the same account and have an extra card, you're responsible for that debt. Many times, um, you know, people are the victim of fraud, they're the victim of elder abuse, or maybe they're slipping and they run up credit, credit charges on a bunch of stuff. Uh, this is kind of a dicey one. Uh, I would really encourage you if you're looking at this, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, my, my mom ran up a bunch of credit cards and then she passed away. If you call the credit card company, they're going to have your name and your phone number and they're going to call you till, you know, till they're paid. It, that's one where you may want to go through a lawyer and have the lawyer reach out to the credit card company because they won't call us, right? They'll just send us nasty grams. Um, but it's better. It keeps those, those creditors from, you know, calling you all the time. Funeral expenses. Uh, this is kind of, a, kind of a weird one on funeral expenses because typically people pass away and then you have to um, inter the person or cremate the person or, or whatever it is before 
you do the rest of the stuff before you do this trust administration is what it's called. It's this process of administering a trust and prepaying a funeral is a really good idea. So if you've got parents um, out there and you don't want to be the one to have to put the funeral on your credit card bill because your siblings uh, don't have any money, okay? Encourage your parents to look at prepaid or pre, pre-need planning. So if you go to your local funeral home, you can um, ask them about pre-need planning. They'll say, oh, well, you know, pick your casket, pick the cake you want, all this other stuff. And then you write a check to an insurance company. And then when that person passes away, that funeral is prepaid. And so, you know, if this is you and you're thinking, yeah, my, my two loser siblings don't have any money. And if mom and dad died, I'm going to be the one putting the $20,000 funeral on my credit card. You might want to encourage your parents to, uh, to pay that. Otherwise, you're going to have to go through this reimbursement process. Stale trusts are old trusts, like, you know, stale crackers. You open up the bag and let them sit there for a few years. Stale trusts are, uh, can be worse than having no trust at all. Let me put it that way. So stale trusts are outdated. Maybe people have passed away. Um, you know, they've gotten remarried or divorced or whatever it is. Um, really pay, as a general rule, look at your, your trust about every year, once a year. Guns are, are an interesting one. I just, I'm, I'm mentioning firearms, not on, from a political standpoint, uh, because obviously that's a hot political button. But if you do have firearms, those are regulated. Not only are regulated by the federal government, but state and local agencies. If you cannot safely handle a firearm, do not handle the firearm, okay? There's, you know, what they say to kids, if you see a gun, run. Just don't even handle it if you can't handle it safely. And I would counsel you to go through a federal firearms licensee on any transfer of a firearm. You should know that as a federal felony, to cross a state border to deliver a firearm, even if that person is entitled to receive it under the will or the trust. So it's very important, a lot of rules connected with firearms. Um, Choosing a trustee. You know, um, there's a law, a saying in the law, which is being white of heart and empty of brain, which means you're a really good person, but you're really not up to the task of being successor trustee. And I think it's a balance of experience versus temperament versus aptitude. So whether you're the millennial seeking to appoint a successor trustee or, you know, you, you're thinking, well, uh, my sister was appointed successor trustee because she was older, but she's real, you know, she's really not up to the task. That's something you would want to check in with your, your parents on and be like, hey, mom and dad, I saw this webinar. Um, you know, I'm not sure that's the correct person. A lot of times it's just by order of age. Um, and then if you, you know, lump all the five kids together, that's kind of a bad idea. And then a trust company versus a trust bank. A trust banks are the big boys, the national ones. You know, these are the household bank names that have trust companies attached to them. And then there's something, uh, or that have trust services attached to them. And then there's a trust company, which are typically very smaller. Many of them are in in, uh, zero state income tax jurisdictions like Nevada, South Dakota, uh, Tennessee, and and Alaska. And these tend to be, uh, they charge significantly fewer fees and they're much smaller organizations. So you don't have to wait three months to get a distribution from a trust. Um, And then who's supervising the trustee? So who's watching over the trustee? Folks, the answer is nobody. Okay, so you really need to pick uh, your trustee wisely. They need to uh, be, I I would say, somebody who is more conciliatory, more of a peacemaker rather than a war maker. Um, And and these are some things that you go through when you when you hire a lawyer to go through the trustee selection. That's the counseling part where where the lawyer and the client uh, talk about this. Again, personal liability and then a trust protector. So a trust protector is someone who has power over the trust, but is not the trustee. We have a whole webinar on this. I would really encourage you to uh, check out what a trust protector is and it is on our YouTube page. Um, Let's talk about protecting inheritances from threats and then we'll we'll pick up with our questions here and and wrap it up. Uh, We have something called the Inheritance Protection Trust. So what this is, is, and I know we've had a few questions on here. How do we protect my kid's inheritance from, um, from a divorce, a divorcing spouse? Well, one great way to do it is with a trust that continues on after you passed away. So if you're a millennial and you're thinking, yeah, I want to protect this from a potential threat, um, you might want to talk to your parents about, hey, I watched this webinar and there's this thing called the Inheritance Protection Trust. I discussed it in my book. Basically, it's a structure that keeps the property protected from creditors. And um, you know, divorce, I think, is the biggest, the biggest creditor. Predator would be the government in terms of taxes. 
If you live in a high tax jurisdiction like California or New York or New Jersey, uh, sometimes it's better if you inherit money to move that trust to Nevada, okay, or to move that trust to Florida, or to move that trust to, to Tennessee or Alaska, because then income that is not distributed from the trust only pays federal taxes. And so you can sort of play that tax arbitrage game. Uh, when, when using a continuing trust, we, we typically recommend that you um, uh, have a trust protector appointed because these trusts typically require court action if you need to tweak them, if you need to change some terms, and a trust protector keeps you out of probate court. And these are all continuing trusts. So what are some, some other things beyond the living trust? Uh, these, are, uh, these are what we chalk up to hating the death tax strategies. Um, AB trusts are largely obsolete. Not in every instance, but largely obsolete. They were just kind of the default and they're no longer the default. So if you're a millennial and you're concerned that your parents have an AB trust, you're going to probably want to check in with them and be like, hey, you know, that's, I'm hearing some criticism on that. And that's been the case for about the last 11 years or so now. Um, states have their own taxes too. They have their own inheritance tax. So something to be mindful of, you know, for example, Oregon, it's 16% on amounts over a million. So if you have a, a piece of property in Oregon and you have a million dollar estate in California, that property is going to pay the full 16% on the full value because they put those Oregon properties on top of the, on top of the, of the, of the value of the estate. Uh, real estate, and again, real estate's different tax tax differently than intangible property. So if you do have that property in one of those jurisdictions that has a death tax, you're going to want to convert that to an intangible potentially by putting it into an LLC. So that is one of the workarounds. And then we also have some other advanced strategies that we've co covered in other webinars, charitable trusts, gift annuities, grats, and idgets. And that is the end. And we will open it up for questions. Here's our, our YouTube page. You know, I mentioned it, but this is what our YouTube page looks like. And I, these are the videos and these are in chronological order. So a lot of great content in here. And sometimes it's me speaking, sometimes it's not me speaking, but I would really encourage you to check that out. There's a wealth of information there. And I will tell you, one of the things that just fires me up and gets me going is taking all these difficult concepts and hopefully boiling them down into um, understandable terms where even normal people can understand this uh, dense sort of legal stuff. Uh, check out our uh, webpage here. And there is a, um, if you'd like to make an appointment, there's a request appointment button and that'll guide you through how to make an appointment with, uh, with one of our attorneys at Cunningham Legal. And subscribe to our YouTube page. Please share this. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's really easy. Just hit the subscribe button and review us on Google. So let's talk about, let's hit some questions here and then we'll we will wrap it up and let you guys get on with your lives. Uh, Anonymous asks, if the value of the estate is less than the estate limits, is it better to keep the revocable living trust as a life insurance beneficiary, not a separate life insurance trust? Anonymous, um, it may, that may be the case. I would say it just depends uh, on what you're doing. But um, in many instances, yes. I would say the one um, area where I would say maybe no uh, is if you are a pilot or you're engaged in activities that could uh, cause a lot of liability associated with your death. So that would be something to talk about one-on-one -on -one with a lawyer. But generally speaking, you could leave the beneficiary of the life insurance. Um, typically, we leave it the spouse, then the living trust on non-taxable estates. So these would be estates under six and 12 and 24 million. Are both term life insurance, permanent life insurance, be in the irrevocable life insurance trust? Yeah, permanent life insurance, if it's for death taxes, uh, oftentimes, I mean, should be in the life insurance trust. Uh, term insurance, <laughs> the, here's... You want to hear the truth on term insurance? Are you ready? It never pays out because people live. Yeah, I mean, people do die and they, they collect it. But the reason why it's so cheap is because most people live past the term. So it doesn't really make sense to have that in the irrevocable trust. We typically don't, don't put that in the irrevocable trust. Is an AB trust a stale trust? Uh, could be. You know, I would, I would say uh, these are trusts that were written a long time ago to address laws that have changed and just cause a lot of problems and grief and headache for the families. And it's really easy. You do a restatement, you get rid of all of it. It's a big fat daddy amendment that takes care of everything. And it's a very low level, um, you know, it's not a lot of, you know, you don't have to go to court. You don't have to do a bunch of weird stuff. You just go to the attorney's office and fix it. Is a successor trustee the same as a beneficiary when there's only one child involved? Uh, beneficiary is the person who gets the goods, the bene in Latin, they get the, the stuff in the trust. The trustee is the person who's driving the trust, right? They're in charge of the trust. 
oftentimes they're the same person, right? So in that case, if your only child is your successor trustee uh, and, and beneficiary, it's the same person, different role, okay? It's a lot like Boss Hogg from Dukes of Hazard from the 70s, you know, he was the sheriff and he would take his hat off and he put his judge's hat on. So same person, different roles. Uh, what if the parent and child are residents of different states with the revocable living trust? Well, living trusts are valid throughout the 50 states. Uh, shouldn't be a problem. Um, and that's just something you'd want to raise with your, you know, whether it's us or your own estate planning attorney, you would want to raise that with, with, uh, with them. Is a continuing trust different from a revocable trust? Okay, so a continuing trust. So a revocable trust is what you create as the foundation of your plan. It's like the caterpillar that becomes the butterfly. So while you're alive, your living trust is caterpillar. But when you die, that living trust becomes the butterfly and the continuing trust is the butterfly. I hope that helps. Is the AB trust the last name of husband, last name of wife, revocable, revocable trust? Uh, well, you would look in the trust anonymous. You would look in the trust and see, and this is, you probably should do this with a lawyer. What happens when one spouse dies? Is there a split of assets or not? Is it mandatory? Is it optional? And that's something we could go through with you one-on-one -on -one about what your trust says and, and basically read it and tell you in English, right? Not legalese, what it says. What vehicle would you, you, would you use to protect half community property for one spouse's children from the first marriage? Hmm. Uh, you might want to, Linda, that's a really good question. Um, you would want to use a living trust. And uh, if I understand this, uh, what we've done for other clients is they say, look, if I'm married, I have community property. I want my half of the community property to go to my kid. And I don't want my spouse, you know, to, you know, marry someone else and end up with the money. Uh, you can use a structure called a Q-tip, which is a qualified terminable interest property trust. That is one vehicle that is purpose-built for that. Um, and that's something we could certainly help you with. Is real estate property mentioned primary house or investment real estate house? Well, real estate is a term that describes uh, real property, which is dirt, which is land. Um, so it could be a primary or an investment property. Anonymous says, if we hire a trust protector for our trust, do we pay annually? Our firm does not charge annually for that. We only charge it when we do something or just when we die to administer the trust. I would say that, you know, we, we put trust protectors uh, routinely in estate plans and very infrequently do I take any action. And typically it's literally changing a word or two. Um, so it typically happens within the trust administration process and, um, you know, the charges are what we would say de minimis. It's just not, not that much. Uh, Brian says, do you like the Roth 401k for business owners who can't do traditional Roth due to income? Yeah, I do. I like it a lot. And I think that's something you need to talk with your financial advisor about and, and CPA and make sure it makes sense. Uh, Anita says, Doug question. If we can access past seminars, does that mean we, we had clicked on YouTube already? Uh, you, you would, you would subscribe, you hit the subscribe button, uh, and then you can hit the little bell that, um, alerts you when we have new videos. Anonymous asks, is that pilot and surgeons same category for the purpose of life insurance islet or RLT? Uh, yeah, we might want to have the, for the pilot, typically the spouse is primary beneficiary than the trust. Um, but again, you know, that that's kind of a, a different, a different topic, but uh, we typically have the permanent insurance. Uh, if it's for death tax purposes in the islet, if this is permanent insurance for, um, for your own retirement, it's not in a in life insurance trust. Sylvia asks, our trust was written 25 years ago, but property was never put in the trust. Is there a restatement or do we just start new? Sylvia, we would probably do a restatement and put your property into the trust because we don't, you might've had one property back in the day go in that trust, but we'd probably just do a restatement on that. Uh, where's your office at if we want to make an appointment with you? Well, we do Zoom, so it's wherever you are. And then we have offices in the LA area and offices in the Bay area of, of San Francisco and the capital region. So we have those on our website. Anonymous asks is, is if splitting is optional in the RLT for the AB trust, is it better not to split, correct? I couldn't tell you in, you know, generally it's not as good, but sometimes it might be. It depends on the size of your estate. It depends on when people die. It depends on what the death tax exemptions are. And I hate to say it depends, but I would say for the vast majority of people, for 99.7% of the population, the AB trust is of zero utility uh, when it comes to taxes. Now there's different utility for other purposes, but I'm talking strictly taxes, no benefit. 
If permanent life insurance is in an RLT, can you still take a loan from its cash value? Yes. Typically, the ownership does not go into a, a living trust. Typically, it stays in your own name. Um, okay. Well, that wraps it up. Another one. We look forward to uh, seeing you. Uh, it'll be someone else next week because I'm on vacation. And the week after that, I'll be back. So have a great day.